Good morning, everyone. This is Jos Huyne talking, and it's time to start with our webinar about white band tympanometry. Today we will have session one of around white band tympanometry. Before we start, uh, I'll introduce myself shortly. My name is Jos. I'm from the Netherlands. I live in Denmark and I work for Interacoustics. I've been an audiologist before and uh, I've studied physics and uh, in Interacoustics I do a lot of training and I, I'm involved in uh, development and product management. The contents of today is that we will first talk about uh, the history of tympanometry, then the limitations of the, the probe tone as we know it from traditional tympanometry, and uh, that allows us to introduce wideband tympanometry. Uh, I will demonstrate it live. I will swap over to show my desktop so that you can see measurements uh, uh, taking place. Then we will go over the be benefits one by one. And then in the end, we will have a summary. Let's start with the history of tympanometry. Um, if we go far back, oh, that is too quick. That's an error in the in the presentation. What I was going to say is that already before 1600, the first persons, uh, Dr. Vesalva, he uh, wrote about the, the, the middle ear. He was the first one to describe uh, the middle ear, uh, how it works. And then between 1700 and 1800, there was a doctor uh, who named the Eustachian tube after this first doctor. We, we jump all the way to 1860 to see that Toyn B is the first one to make an instrument for investigating something with regards to the middle ear, which was the otoscope and also an Eustachian tube catheter, which he called the Explorer. The first tympanometer was built in 1940 by Metz. It was an impedance bridge which could uh, measure reflexes. It could measure uh, the, 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 the compliance of the middle ear. He did not use pressure yet. It took a few years until around uh, 1959, 1960, when, when they found out that adding a pressure sweep is beneficial because by moving completely up to the positive pressure, you, you, you get ear canal properties only, and then you can separate ear canal properties from the middle ear properties that we are interested in. So pressurization was added back then. And if you look uh, at the tympanometer of that day, then the tympanometer did not change anymore between then and today, you can say. So the tympanometer, if, if you imagine that what you see on the screen here is a, uh, a ear canal in which we inserted a probe. The, the probe has a speaker to make a probe tone, which is typically 226 hertz, or for babies it is 1000 hertz. It has a pump, so we, we can pressurize the, the ear canal, and it has a microphone uh, to measure the response. And then on the right, we see a tympanogram, as we all know it from traditional tympanometry. This really didn't change much for the last roughly 50 years. So what are limitations of 226 hertz? First of all, if we test babies under six months, the problem is that with 226 hertz, we, we, we measure ear canal properties instead of uh, uh, the properties of the middle ear. And to overcome that, we can use 1000 hertz. And secondly, the 226 hertz probe tone doesn't really differentiate well for quite a lot of pathologies of the middle ear. And this is just one example. If we look at the otosclerosis, where there is a fixation of, of the uh, stapes, then basically the tympanogram can look pretty normal, almost the same as, a, 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 as in the very normal cases. So limitation is basically that it doesn't differentiate very well with 226 hertz. Now, wh why did we accept uh, that tympanometry is, is using only one or two frequencies? Was it convenience? In fact, it was because the 226 hertz uh, probe tone is chosen because the calibration becomes very easy. So it's convenience and the calibration became easy. Then the consequence is that it maybe made life very simple. So maybe we accepted it because of simplicity. Maybe it became tradition over the last 50 years. There, there is a lot of people that say, yeah, but it's good enough. I know how to use it. And my question is basically, is it not ignorance that we, that, that we accept one frequency being used? If we look at pure tone audiometry, 
then of course we test all frequencies that are relevant for the ear. There was a professor uh, in, in the US who explained to us if you do tympanometry only with 226 Hertz, that is the same as, uh, as when, when you do an audiogram at only 2000 Hertz. You, you test one frequency, when the threshold is normal, then you conclude, okay, it's normal, so let's don't test anything else. Well, that's a little bit ridiculous. And uh, similarly, that, uh, it, it counts for the middle ear diagnostics as well, including one frequency is a little bit ridiculous. With OAEs, we also focus on an area which is important for the ear. We do the same with ABR. And what we now offer is that with wideband tympanometry, we can use the full range of frequencies that is important for the ear. And in that way, we are sure that uh, differential diagnostics will become easier. So it's time to introduce wideband tympanometry. Um, the difference between traditional tympanometry lies mostly in the, the probe tone that is being used. So we think away the single probe tone and we put in a click, which we see on the left-hand side in the, in, uh, as function of time. Uh, a click is very short in time, but it contains many, many frequencies. And on the right-hand side, we can see that it's a very flat frequency spectrum for the full frequency range of the audiogram. This click is repeated very quickly, which means that in time, we very quickly get, get points that we connect together in a graph. So let's look at the real measurement. I now need to switch to my monitor. Now I need to find the probe of my Titan and put it in my ear. The probe is now going in my ear. We can see um, uh, the, the status became in ear. I will now press the start button in the software. And of course, I had to be quiet during the measurement. Um, OK, so now we have a 3D graph on the screen. I can show a thick line. You can see the thick line at the bottom. And that thick line is our 226 tympanogram. What we see is that if I rotate a little bit, we, we see on, on, on the bottom right, we see the frequencies. So for all tympanograms, for all frequencies are available in this graph. And let's move the mouse over all frequencies or the curve. I, I can, if I slowly move, then you, you should see that I show different tympanograms at different frequencies with the bold line. Some people wonder if they have to understand these type of 3D graphs. The, the answer is no, it is really meant to be pretty it it is meant to impress people and it is meant as a uh, as a uh, tool to explain to uh, to to new users how wideband tympanometry is used the useful information we present in an easier way which is done uh, with regards to tympanograms that's in the tympanogram step so what we see here is three tympanograms i show the tympanogram at 226 hertz on the left in the middle i show the thousand hertz tympanogram and on the right, I show resonance frequency tympanogram. And that's a big coincidence that my resonance frequency is now measured at exactly 1000 Hertz as well. That's just a coincidence. It's close to 1000 Hertz mostly, but I've never seen it to be identical. That's just fun. What we can also show is a new type of tympanogram. I right mouse click on the middle graph and then I select the adult, the average between 375 up to 2000 Hertz. And here we see a wideband averaged tympanogram. To explain what a wideband averaged tympanogram is, I need to switch back to my presentation. The wideband uh, tympanogram uh, can be understood as follows. We take all the tympanograms that are between two lines. For adults, that's 375 up to 2000. What you see in this picture is a thick line at 800 hertz and at 2000 hertz. That is the frequency range that we use for uh, when we test children under the age of six months. We, we take all those lines and we, we average it to a single line and then we plot it into the graph and we can compare it to the, to the normative data if it's available. The benefit of taking an average is, is not only that we include information for many frequencies, it is also that 
by taking an average, the, the, the measurement is less sensitive to, to, to noise or movement of the patient. So looking at a, at a, at a single frequency curve will result in a more difficult interpretation if, if the patient is not sitting still. And particularly for small children, that could be a, a, a good argument to, to use the wideband average tympanogram. What we see also, and I didn't mention that yet, is that on the y-axis we do not show compliance. We show absorbance. Absorbance is very similar to compliance in a sense that compliance shows how easy it is for sound to, to pass through a system and absorbance shows how much of the acoustic energy is absorbed into the system. So th those things are similar but displaying it in absorbance, it gives a big benefit that, that uh, the scale is always between 0 and 1, and that makes the whole graph easily scaled and easier to, uh, to make an interpretation of. And for that reason also, the wideband average tympanogram is also in absorbance. So, once again, what is absorbance? Uh, the purple arrow indicates how much energy is sent into the ear canal. The green arrow indicates how much energy is passing through the middle ear si uh, system and the absorbance is the absorbed power over the incident power. If we look at it in a different term, if we look at uh, the part that we measure, we don't measure what goes through, we measure actually what remains in the ear canal and that is the reflectance. And the relation between absorbance and reflectance is that the absorbance is equal to 1 minus the reflectance. Now, in, in literature you find most things described with reflectance terminology. That is because in the past the researchers simply used that as the main uh, 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 as main part of the vocabulary. But in 2012 at the Eric's Home Workshop they all decided that absorbance is a better term. So from now on we will find the newer literature using absorbance all the time. Okay, back to the demonstration because I was of course not done with showing what we have in the software. I go back to the 3D graph in the Titan suite. So far I only showed the tympanograms. And we can see there's also a line in the other direction. And I can isolate that line, for example, by clicking absorbance view, like this. Here we see the absorbance as function of frequency and the absorbance is taken at zero decapascal. So this is at ambient pressure. And I, I can move it, for example, to my peak pressure. My peak pressure is just next to it at minus 28. But at peak pressure and at ambient pressure, that is the most interesting slices to look at. Though from this graph, you cannot make an interpretation or it's very difficult to give any meaning to what it is. So we go to the absorbances graphs. In my example, I show uh, uh, two graphs. The left graph shows the absorbance at ambient pressure and the right graph shows it at peak pressure. The right graphs also demonstrate a gray line which is also the absorbance at ambient pressure. You could do with a single graph but I thought just for the explanation maybe it's nice to see them next to each other as well. Now the big question is how do we make an interpretation of these graphs? And what you can see if I do a test on my ear, my ear always has relatively low absorbance in the region of 3000 hertz, just bef between two and 4000 hertz, you can say. And so, so people then ask, yeah, you fall outside the normal area, so is my ear bad? I, I would say no, because I think my ear is good. Maybe there is something that I don't know about. But generally speaking, it is that people focus a lot on the details when they learn these new things. They, they, they really dive into the details and they try to see which corner, which frequency do I look at to, to, to make a diagnosis. And, and my answer is try to take a few steps back, look at the graph from a distance and, and say, does it more or less fit in the normal area, yes or no? Is it maybe more or less generally low or is it high or is it on spot? And, and make a general I impression. And then very important, don't look at the absorbance graph by itself. Look at, at which pressure is it obtained. Where is the peak pressure? If you see an abnormal absorbance, but the peak pressure is close to zero, then 
maybe that depending on the shape it will indicate that it is related to otosclerosis but is your peak pressure far from zero then it could be a more a more commonly negative middle ear pressure or it, it, it could be uh, related to fluids and so combining the peak pressure with with the graph is very important to make it a little bit easier we decided to implement examples and i can show them on the bottom uh, i'll rescale them a little bit so i see a few more some people also get confused by the, these examples because the example that I now put in the graph is showing how it could look like if there is middle ear with effusion. But this doesn't mean that every measurement on a middle ear with effusion sh shows a line that is very close to this. And I have noticed that many first time users really try to look at how similar is the measurement. Ideally, we would not have put in these examples. Ideally, we would have put in an area which shows in which area do you expect middle ear effusion or in which area do you expect negative middle ear pressure, maybe in which area do you expect otosclerosis. Now, the problem is that we were not allowed to put such normative data for pathologies in our system because the, the research so far available is not having big enough populations for us to uh, to be allowed to implement it. Let me show one example more because I think the ossicular discontinuity is very interesting. The ossicular discontinuity is an example where there is a high peak of its absorbance. This high peak is typically close to the resonance frequency and very often this peak is even at a lower frequency than in the example that we show here. I will show more of such examples later. Okay, one more thing I want to demonstrate before we go to the benefits. On the left hand side, you have this drop down box which shows the age of the patient. The age of the patient is automatically selected by the database if the uh, birthday of the patient is known. But it is important to realize that if you run standalone, th th this, this age is taken from the protocol. And it is important to know that a different calibration is used for patients older than six months and for patients younger than six months. So if the system does not take the correct age automatically, select before you do the measurement so it uses the correct calibration. Now, the, the function after the, the measurement you could say is that by clicking on the different age groups you would get a different norm set behind your measurement and then m maybe for some children if, if let's say we test a baby of two months of age should we then match to, to one data set or should we match to the other data set and you can flip between the two to, to see if it makes an important difference or not. Good. Let's go back to the presentation. Oh, I see that uh, deep has a question, how is the peak pressure calculated? That is a very good question. So I go one slide, a few slides back. If you think about how the wideband average tympanogram is calculated, it is the average of all those tympanograms. It results in a single line and the peak pressure is simply the peak of this graph. And so, so generally speaking, in, in wideband tympanometry, we report the peak pressure this is the peak pressure that we use if we, for example, do a reflex measurement after a, a 3D measurement, then the, this is the peak pressure that is sent over. If we look at tympanograms at individual frequencies, then below those tympanograms in the tympanogram step, it shows the peak pressure for that slice, but that's not the peak pressure that we use elsewhere if, if needed. Okay, let's continue with the presentation. I ended up at the benefits what appears now on the screen is a overview of all information that we pull out of a 3D graph. We see on the left hand side we see absorbances graphs, on the right hand side we see uh, tympanograms. The way we explain it is that the tympanogram side is about improving the traditional. It's improving what we already know, what we have, what, what people are comfortable with. On the left hand side that is adding new possibilities to differential diagnostics. Th that is where most of the value comes from, including the full frequency range. 
Then in the middle we have the resonance frequency. We do not often talk about it. It's also because th there was not much research done yet about how valuable the resonance frequency is and, and how different the resonance frequency can be uh, between, for example, the Titan or the 8235 or other equipments. Do you think that the degree of absorbance will correlate with the degree of conductive hearing loss, is uh, Matthew asking. There is some literature indicating that on a group level, the absorbance graph does indicate the size of the conductive hearing loss. The problem is, however, that on a, based on a single measurement, you cannot predict how big the conductive hearing loss is because the spread amongst different uh, individuals is too big for that. But on a group level, is, the answer is yes. Um, to add a little bit more to that, if you look at it from a more screening purpose, there, there is a big study done on school-aged children, then you could say predicting the exact conductive hearing loss is rather difficult if it's like 15 dB or 25 dB, but saying the, how likely is it that there is a big conductive hearing loss, bigger than 30 dB, making such a predictor, it's big or it's not really, uh, it's rather small or not present, that can be done. Making a very precise estimate, that is not possible at this time. Let's run over the benefits. Benefit number one, what can we do for the detection and monitoring of otosclerosis? What we display here is a graph that is taken from a study from Navid Shanas and he tested on 64 normal ears and found this area indicating the normal absorbance. Then he tested on 28 otosclerotic ears, which gives the uh, kind of red area. And we see that the absorbance in the lower frequency is a lot lower compared to the normal ears. And his study shows that looking at absorbance alone gives a predictive value of over 80% for otosclerotic ears. So 80, I believe it was 82% of the cases he could predict otosclerosis correctly with only the use of absorbance. And that is much higher than using a reflex measurement or uh, I mean a tip pentagram cannot even predict it at all. He also published some older articles about using the resonance frequency. Also by looking at the resonance frequency you can talk about the likelihood of otosclerosis. With otosclerosis, the uh, middle ear becomes more stiff and a system that is more stiff will have a higher resonance frequency. If the resonance frequency is extremely high, in that case, our system uh, will maybe report that there is no resonance frequency because, well, it, it's outside the, the, the range that we analyze. So look at the resonance frequency and look at the absorbance graph and realize this is the absorbance graph at peak pressure and the peak pressure is expected to be close to zero and that is a big difference with other pathologies. Benefit number two, the detection and monitoring of a disarticulation of the ossicular chain. When using traditional tympanometry then we expect a peaky tympanogram, much more peaky maybe than, than the one th that is used in this uh, example. But we cannot differentiate between a flaccid eardrum or a disarticulation of the ossicular chain. Now, with absorbance we can. This is a very nice example where we see that there is a high peak in the lower frequencies. There's also a very low peak between 3 and 4,000 hertz. But we don't look at that one. That one is not so relevant. Uh, the one in the high frequencies is not so relevant. The relevance is in the very high peak close to the resonance frequency in, in the lower frequencies. This is a typical pattern for a disarticulation. Now, if, if we wonder how would it look like for a flaccid eardrum, I do not know the answer precisely, but if I understood correctly, then the absorbance will also be higher in the low frequency region, but it will not show such a clear peak. It will be a wider range, and it is Navichines who says that you can clearly differentiate between one and the other. Though uh, I really like to talk to him again to know a little bit better how that is done then precisely. For two things, we can look at the absorbance graph. Also again, we can look at the resonance frequency because resonance frequency will drop down. If, if, if the system becomes more loose, the resonance frequency becomes lower. Okay, benefit number three. This is about testing on babies and uh, small children. 
we split up the benefits in three slides. Benefit number one is if, if we stick to the traditional tympanometry, that it, the certain age range, you are not certain which proton frequency to use. And people usually talk the range between f four and six months. We put eight months because some babies get born far too early and then it becomes very complicated what the age exactly means if a baby was born too early. Benefit one with babies is that we get 226 hertz and 1000 hertz at the same time with one single effort. And I have heard from clinics testing wideband tympanometry uh, in the early days, they wanted the system just for that reason because they, they do one measurement and they have everything and that they couldn't make an interpretation of every measurement yet. That was not the main argument. This was the main argument to keep it. The second benefit on babies is the use of the wideband averaged tympanogram. When babies are tested with 1000 Hz, very often the curve is difficult to make an interpretation of, particularly if the, if, if the baby is not fully cooperative. With a averaged measurement, it, there is less noise and the frequency range of this measurement is optimized to differentiate best for babies. And it is reported in literature that the predictive value of the wideband average tympanogram is much, much higher than uh, for 1000 Hz tympanograms. The third part related to babies uh, is with regards to uh, absorbance measurements. When measuring absorbance on babies, we can here see that the, the, the normative area is a little bit different than for adults. It's, it's, uh, we, we measure higher absorbance in babies. And when the middle ear is showing a pathology, and most of the time that will be fluids, then the absorbance will become much lower. And, and it, it means that seeing that there is a middle ear problem uh, maybe a temporary middle ear problem becomes a lot easier with the absorbance graph than with uh, tympanograms. I'll take time for the question that is just asked. If a clinic is already using ABR or ASSR, will wideband tympanometry be a benefit for them to use? I assume that clinics, they use ABR or ASSR because they want to test babies after the neonatal hearing screening. And the problem with those babies, at least if I speak from my own experience, what we would always do is we, we would try OAEs again and we would try to measure the 1000 Hz tympanogram. And those measurements very often were not successful. And then if we did an ABR or ASSR and the results were a little bit doubtful, like, yeah, is this something or not 40 dB or is it 30 dB? We, we don't dare to make a very strong conclusion. Then I would really miss a good indication if uh, about if the middle ear is involved. And wideband tympanometry allows you to give a good indication of middle ear involvement. If absorbance shows clearly a abnormal pattern and uh, in indicating there is a middle ear problem, then it is relatively safe to say, okay, we wait a few weeks before we try to do either the screening again or we try to do the ABR or ASSR again because it, it, it might be a temporary middle ear problem and, and that is very often the reason for a OAE screening failing first time in neonatal screening programs. So I would say yes, it's absolutely a benefit to use in addition to ABR and ASSR. Benefit number four about pre- and post-operative monitoring. What we see here is a autoscleurotic ear, and uh, before the operation, we could do a measurement with absorbance, and we see that at the top graph. And now, this measurement is done without adding pressure. We have two wideband tympanometry tests in the Titan suite. One is the 3D measurement, and the other one is a measurement at, at uh, for ambient pressure, but you can also do it at peak pressure. If you do it at ambient pressure, then it is relatively safe to do the measurement also shortly after the operation. Doctors do not like to put the middle ear under pressure shortly after the operation, but Titan will re uh, keep the pressure at ambient pressure. And if you insert the probe carefully, then it's safe to do a, a measurement immediately after. And maybe during or, or shortly after the operation, you can already get an indication about if removing the otosclerosis if the operation has been successful. Benefit number five, seeing through pressure equalization tubes and seeing through perforations. 
if there is a perforation or if there is a pressure equalization tube, then the traditional tympanogram will show a flat line and uh, there will be a very high volume indicated for the ear canal volume. And that is because the system between ear canal and uh, the, the middle ear cavity is completely open. The example that I will show now is, is showing that if there is a small perforation or even a bigger perforation, the absorbance can still be measured in a relatively normal area. But the example here shows that it's not completely normal. It shows clearly the pattern of a disarticulation. And it was given to us by, by Eric uh, Hagerstrom, who is uh, in, in the Copenhagen area. And he confirmed by surgery that this was indeed not only a perforation, but also a, uh, a disarticulation of the ossicular chain. And our suggestion is that m maybe for seeing through the um, uh, pressure equalization tube, maybe there is also a benefit, but there is not, nobody yet who investigated if there is any value of doing an absorbance measurement on, on children with uh, tubes placed. Benefit number six. It's a completely different area. It's about the, the detection of semicircular canal dehiscence. There is a recent study done by uh, Heidi Nakajima who indicates that by measuring absorbance uh, you can reach 92% sensitivity and 72% specificity for, for detecting semicircular circular canal dehiscence. And one of the graphs that she uh, shared in one of her, her uh, articles is the one shown here which has the absorbance, I believe it's either the absorbance at a at 2000 hertz or or maybe it was an area which was averaged but the height of the absorbance as function of the airbone gap gives a very good indication if it's semicircular canal dehiscence or if it's maybe a fixation or a discontinuity we really hope to see more from Heidi Nakajima uh, she's writing some articles now and as soon as they get published we will share with everyone that there is more information and the relevance of it let's go to the question that was just asked in case of a perforated ear, will you not use an absorbance measurement without applying pressure? If the ear shows a perforation, then if it is safe to do the measurement, then you do not need to stick at ambient pressure. Of course, you can do the measurement ambient pressure only. And also, of course, when you do the pressurized measurement, the, the measurements at all pressures will appear approximately the same if you know that there is a perforation then maybe it is easiest to just do the ambient pressure measurement okay I was finished with uh, sh showing the different uh, benefits so I will show a summary here we have seen the benefit of many tympanograms that are being measured at one time we can measure shortly before and after an operation we, we have benefits with regards to autosclerosis, with regards to disarticulation of the ossicular chain. Maybe, but that's relatively unknown, a benefit with regards to tubes. And then I think a lot of weight needs to be put on the benefits with small children, not only because it, it is three elements there where clinicians benefit from, it is also because the clinicians testing with infants, they are much more used to adapt to new, new ch technology. They are the first movers. They, they were the first ones to accept autoacoustic emissions. They are the ones that get to know ASSR and ABR. That's really our door into the clinical environment where if we look at the benefits for adults, there, there's also quite a few but not everyone adopts as easy uh, it's more conservative in in the adult uh, diagnostics you could say now and the last one is the detection of semicircular canal dehiscence uh, which is in the balance area Th there has been suggested suggested that there might be more applications in the balance area maybe with Meniere's disease maybe other pathologies time will tell so what I hope is that I gave you some new insights and that the theory of wideband tympanometry became clear. I want to thank everyone for participating uh, uh, today and, and then I hope very much to talk to you again, let's say it in that way. Bye bye for now.